The incredibly charming American musician Janie Rothfield is a great traditional fiddler, banjo player, educator, composer, and so much fun to talk to. She shared several of her original tunes on both violin and banjo, and we talked about teaching music, accompanying dancers, creativity, and the importance of making connections through music. Janie has created a unique series of weekend workshops called Janie's Jumpstart Camps, and she records and tours with many different bands. Her website is linked in the description. I have included timestamps as well, and this conversation, along with all the episodes, is available in podcast format on your favorite podcast player, as well as video. The transcript will be published to my blog, and everything is linked on my website in the description. Hey, Jenny Rothfield. So thanks so much for joining me. Oh, I'm so happy to see you. I'm just excited to have a chat. And I should have checked. I know you're known as Jane and Janie. What, what do you prefer? Uh, Janie's fine. I, I started about in um, 2014. I inaugurated my Janie's Jumpstart Weekend Music yeah. Camp. So I sort of started. Some people have always called me Janie. Some people call me Jane. So Janie's good. We'll be Janie okay. today. <laughs> Since it's your website, it might <laughs> help yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> JanieRothfield.com. Yeah. So um, I'm so glad you agreed to play for us. You're an acoustic roots musician. You play a lot of old time music and different styles and both violin, banjo, and you also play some guitar and sing. Yep. So um, I see you're, you're holding your fiddle. So if you want to start with the tune, that would be awesome. Oh, if you're okay, of sure. Let's see. Well, um, how about if we start off, start off with one of my favorite traditional tunes I've been playing lately. I've moved down to Virginia from Philadelphia and before that up in Albany, New York, and before that Scotland. So we've been moving south and I've had a chance to uh, get exposed to a lot more, uh, more musicians and different styles of fiddling. And I really like the fiddling of Uncle Norm Edmonds from Hillsville, Virginia. He was a classic uh, rap, uh, Galax style fiddler and this is one of the tunes that I just spoke to me when I first heard it. It's called New Jordan and so I'm going to play it a little bit fast and in the style so I hope you enjoy it. Let's see. <laughs> I pretended like I was playing at one of the fiddlers conventions for that one. <laughs> in, in what way? Oh, just putting it out there, having fun. Yeah. Thinking there was a bunch of people clogging in the distance, you know. Just... I was going to ask about that because you play for a lot of dances, a lot of yeah. counter dances. Yep, a lot of counter and dances. I, and I couldn't keep my feet still while you're playing that. Oh, so. oh perfect. That's, then I've won. <laughs> Such a great rhythmic drive to your playing. I've listened to tons of your recordings, of course, to prepare for this and I'm curious about rhythmic variety because you always have such a such a cool groove and and in what seems to be simple music in some ways you it, you make it so I don't know so interesting. Well, I, I appreciate that you noticed that because I, I I used to say that I had a terrible attention span and so I couldn't repeat things over and over and over again. But I think as an artist, I've realized over the many many years that I've been playing music that. I do like, I'm a creative person and I like to create things with my music and I'm not a good replicator, I can, but I've always liked to take a little musical journey, uh, push the envelope a little bit, um, but always staying sort of true to what, what the original kind of feel of the tune is or the melody is. Mm -hmm. um, 
going out on a limb, maybe sawing it off a little bit, but always coming back. And I think that that has to do with just from when I first started playing uh, violin as a little child in the Suzuki method, where it was all about the rhythms and the different bowing patterns. And then starting to play fiddle music in Connecticut and hearing old musicians from Quebec, Leo Baudouin from Canton, Connecticut, Collinsville, Connecticut, actually. Mm -hmm. I used to follow him and his wife around at the Fiddler's Convention. So it's been a long time in there. Yeah. Um, but I, I do like to like to have my way with, with tunes as much as I can. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned your um, Suzuki start. So I looked up your, your teacher, Louise Behrens, and I found an article where she was interviewed at the end of her life she was in her late 90s and there was a quote I thought you'd appreciate Ooh. so I'll just read this directly yes please she said uh, the fiddle still comes out of the case every day if it doesn't it looks at me like why an instrument has to be kept alive by playing oh wow that's amazing yeah I thought it was a great quote and I understand you also played for Mr. Suzuki himself when he came to the states yeah I I, I think I went to two conferences or something there's two pictures of me at two different ages so um and we went up there and we played for him and i i remember um i was quite young i've got a picture of myself over there i think i was like maybe seven or something and i'm holding my fiddle like this you know and uh all i remember him doing he didn't speak any english but i just remember him going like this and taking my my nose and pushing it this way because i was probably looking around and saying hello to my parents or something or you know playing for the crowd like I like I do um, and uh, and then I you know played with a bunch of other other young people as well there was another gal that was a uh, the young the young kid me and Marcy Chesnow who found me about six years ago oh. and uh, she and her husband he was he was a Suzuki player and they both play trad style fiddle music as well so we were really excited to to meet up and uh, we were reminiscing about we used to go and go into New York to Miss Barron's apartment with all of her other students and the big kids. They were probably like 13 or something, you know, and Marcy and I would get up there and we would do our twinkle twinkle with our variations and then and they would all play along. It was just kind of just like, you know, a fiddle environment. So mm -hmm. segueing into that style of music was was fairly uh, natural for me. Although Mr. Suzuki, like the fact that he wanted you to have a certain posture. I mean, I, it's so rigid, right? A lot of people still insist that people look down their fingerboard or um... well you know I I think that uh, I I always tell my students not to look yeah now I do because too. <laughs> I think it engages something different in the brain mm -hmm. um, but I think having that that nice I mean it's it's rigid but it's also relaxed because everything is kind of you know you're not like this you're not like mm -hmm. this you're not like this it's just um, but yeah, I guess I, I never got so far that I got yelled at for not having the proper posture. <laughs> I, I noticed Miss Barron yelled at anybody, actually. Yeah, but. it was interesting how she got into that. Like it was saying because she wanted to start when she was very young and they said, you're too young, you know, and, um, and there are other details. I can send you that article later. It was kind I'd of love interesting. to see it. Yeah, yeah. I, remember, I, I tried finding her about 10 years ago, hmm. um, looked her up. And I think I tried, I even called the Suzuki Institute, I think, and I asked them for her email or phone number and they, you know, they were, they didn't want to share her personal information with, mm -hmm. with somebody. So, you know, one of my big regrets is that, or maybe yeah. she knew about me, that she never saw what she created, you know? Yeah. But I'm thankful. So mm -hmm. thankful. And um, in terms of teaching, I'm curious, like, like you mentioned the Janie's Jumpstart and I found that very interesting because you started this quite a few years ago in people's homes, these weekend uh, workshops or camps. Yeah, well, here's the story. So um, I was, I've been doing a lot of teaching and I love teaching and I was thinking that I wanted to have my own camp. And it sort of came as a result of seeing that there were not very women on staff at the, at the old time genre music camps. The Celtic music was a little bit more diverse, mm -hmm. but um, you know, and I started looking at the ratios of men instructors to women. And it was terrible, like two mm. to 24. I mean, it was just, wow. it was bad. And so I said, well, I'm going to start my own camp and I'm going to only have women instructors 
to start. And then it, it took a few years before my friends, Pete Peterson and Kelly Allen in Oxford, PA, who are wonderful old time musicians said, why don't you have it at our house? I said, great. So the, the idea was to have small, small classes, very focusing on technique and creativity and artistry and not learning all the tunes, but how to play them better and internalize the music and things like that. And plus it was really fun. And we had great, uh, great food and just people just had a great time. So that's been going on since 2014. I have a since um, um, invited a few of the men musician teachers to come and play. So it's not, you know, I'm not dis, um, not uh, excluding the, the guys. Um, but it's been great because a lot of the women who hadn't taught at camps, now they've got on the radar and uh, there's a lot more more of us out there teaching. And, and so, um, yeah, it's been really fun. I've done them in lots of different places in different countries and um, it's always exciting. The pandemic um, stopped things a little bit. I did some online things and then this last spring I had two in-person ones and we did not have any any illness as a result of that. So I was very happy with all the precautions and so great to see everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was interesting. So I listened to, um, you know, all these uh, episodes you've done with Cameron DeWitt and oh, yeah. it was over like pre-pandemic and then during the pandemic and just seeing how you'd pivoted because you always seem to have this incredible energy to organize and always play with people and, and, and teach. And yeah. you just seamlessly seem to like, oh, we're going online, we're doing stuff outside. Um, still the same energy but it must have been hard it was like, hard it was well the first thing was of course figuring out the internet and I, who knowed what who knew what upload speed was you yeah know? <laughs> and i was like oh it was a disaster to start and i was starting to panic and then we you know we went to our internet provider and got that figured out and then we figured out you know we didn't need to set up microphones i just have a little this little samsung mic it's i'll show it to you guys it's like and it, I use it in all my all my stuff that I do online, and you know, sort of get it set up so the background looks good. And <laughs> yeah, just keep going, man, and um, try and keep it keep it organized and let people know and share the music. And we had an on uh, we had a jam every Wednesday for uh, yeah maybe a year and a half or something with Bill Wellington, who we put a band together during the pandemic, and then. Um, this winter things I had some other things going on and we we sort of stopped and I know everybody's like missing everybody you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so we'll try and do it do it again sometime soon so. yeah and one of and I heard you to say that you'd done online contra dancing like people were dancing in their kitchens independently That's yeah amazing um, yeah, the Contra Dance uh, community figured out um, a way to do this, and there's some technology. They, they, some of the young people who were involved with it figured out where we'd have a remote caller, and we'd come in and we'd play, and they'd figure out somehow to sync it. And we would not, um, we would not play to what the caller was saying, and we would not look at the dancers because it wasn't in sync. in sync. So we just played, and we knew how many times, and she'd hold up a sign saying two more <laughs> yeah it was kind of fun so there's a tradition of, of um an old tradition that fiddlers would be actually dance callers have you ever Ooh. done that yourself not really officially i can actually play mm -hmm. and call something for people to yeah. do um and i've i've in the back of my mind i've always thought oh i should go to a, take a class and a course and and be a be a caller because it's it's kind of fun. Um, mm -hmm. But I've never really you know done it officially. Maybe at a, like a wedding or something. Circle yeah. left. Turn <laughs> your Swing your partner. <laughs> do si do. <laughs> but it's it's kind of fun. I like yeah. it. Yeah. It's interesting. It seems like there's this incredible community in in the roots uh, acoustic music. Like um, just all these festivals and adults just sort of at camp. You know, learning. Um, it's yeah it seems like in the last you know I didn't grow up with with camps or being able to the way I learned was just by going to festivals or fiddle contests and getting together with people and having jams and mm -hmm. you know we all just played together or listened to the records um, you know there was no video um, uh, there's a lot it was a lot of written music out there I, I never I probably can count on this hand how many tunes I've learned from written music mm -hmm. um, Although I do make up tunes, other people usually end up writing them out for me. Um, 
but uh, yeah, it's an amazing, amazing thing out there. Resources online and in-person camps and the internet and online. It's it's a plethora of opportunities for people. Um, I think it's really important for people to learn from people. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there's a lot of folks that come to the camps who've never played with anybody before. And they're so excited. They're a little nervous, you know. They're like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. And of course they're fine. And it's just, uh, uh, it's just yeah, I, I find it to be a lot, a lot of fun to meet people and play with people and see what we can do and make, fun, make some creative, creative music together, you know. So you have a strong family connection with music in that your husband, Alan Carr, you've been playing with for many years, and also your daughter. Yes. Shona. Yep, Shona, yep. Yeah, Shona and, I, <laughs> and I was curious, um, when you, so when you met Alan, you were in your junior year at college, and you were studying public health policy, was that right? Well, actually, I was doing, I was doing a, a degree, I ended up getting my degree in, in um, political studies, Mm -hmm. with a minor in dance <laughs> oh, <laughs> because I could get all my college credit to graduate from the dance classes that I took and I just I, I just couldn't deal with more than three academic classes at a time um, so when I went to Scotland for my junior year abroad it was just one of these courses where I could take classes at, at this at the college with the other students as opposed to just being in with the Americans and uh, and that was that was that was very rigorous. It was very it was a very different kind of learning situation from what I had been at. I went to Pitzer College in Claremont, California, which was very. It's really suited me as a as a Suzuki kid. It was more broad view as opposed to just slamming out the facts, which I was never particularly good at. Um, but I found I was pretty good at the world view kind of things, and I had some great teachers, um, and the dance teachers I had were really amazing. Um, so I, I do credit some of the um, my ability to teach from those experiences. Although I, I'm not sure I could. Well, actually, I did. I did figure skating when I was a teen, and I had an amazing coach. And I do remember, and I was a, an ice dancer, and I had a partner, Johnny Schober, mm -hmm. and we were, you know, ten and eleven, twelve, thirteen year olds. And I remember uh, he was very it was all all about the music and the feel and you know not just putting your bending your knee but digging into the ice and all these subtle kind of things mm -hmm. that i use when i'm teaching you know the difference between just pulling your bow and making the sound and making tone all those kinds of really subtle things um you know you put your foot out for skating and you don't just put it out you put it out and there's a little maybe a little bend or if you're dancing and you put your arm out it's just not like this it's it's moves there's there's other stuff going on um so anyway make a long story short i i, I realize i use a lot of that kind of thing when i'm hmm. teaching that's very interesting i'm curious how did you balance things as a teenager because that's a huge commitment of time to do dance and figure skating oh i missed a lot of school in junior and <laughs> junior and junior high school yeah I, I think i missed all the classes about um uh grammar because <laughs> when i got to ninth grade and in spanish i had no idea i didn't know what a verb or a noun or any of that stuff was so uh yeah i i did miss a lot of school so i guess i balanced it because i did graduate then yeah. I got a college degree, so. So your parents must have been so supportive. Of, they were very they... supportive, yep. Mom mom was a very busy rheumatology doctor, and my dad was a scientist, and I lived walking distance to the skating rink, so that, mm -hmm. that kind of helped. And Yeah, it, they made it work. Can I say? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mom and Dad. <laughs> you, you've been a touring musician for so long. How did that work when you had a young child? Well, uh, Al and I spent uh, our 20s, mm -hmm. the 80s, uh, playing professionally. We lived in Scotland mm -hmm. for most of the 80s and made three recordings and toured over the, all over the UK. We never really did much in Europe, but we did every, uh, every folk club in the United Kingdom. And we also toured in America, which was amazing. Um, and then at, I sort of burnt out doing all the bookings and things at the end of the 80s. And we moved back to the States and got jobs and uh, we didn't really do a lot of touring but we started playing a lot of for a lot of dances local dances um, and so uh, the kids got in going to local festivals and so the kids got used to going to those and they grew up with a bunch of the other young kids of our mm -hmm. friends so it was kind of you know a community community effort I do remember though 
um, at the Dance Flurry Festival, which is up in Albany, New York, um, started in 1990, I think. And I was there with Shona, who was, she was four months old, and I was staying there, and I all of a sudden I realized I had to go play. And we were talking to this guy, and I said, Shona's sleeping, here's her bag, she's really easy, if she wakes up, just give her a bottle, she's a really good baby. And so I handed my child to this person we had been talking to. And he says, Jane, you're, you're handing me your child. And I said, oh, yeah, I guess I am. He says, do you know who I am? I said, no. no. I said, um, Michael Miller, who is married to Valerie Mendel, who was in any old-time string band with my sister oh. in the early 70s. So it's like, you know, um, full circle kind of stuff like that. So, yeah, a lot of help. We used to go to festivals, and we would bring my friend Lane Braden, who lives in Ottawa, who's a fiddler, um, we bring her down from Ottawa and get her a ticket, and she she look after the kids while we were playing. So we figured it out. Yeah, we didn't lose anybody. <laughs> and, and the duo with your daughter is called Little Missy, right? Yeah. You have such um, funny names for a lot of your so many bands, so many collaborations and albums. Yeah. I love that the whimsy. It's just funny. There's a there's an in joke in my family with Little Missy. We started calling. Like when you have a GPS telling you where to go, it was like before we even had an iPhone. We, I think we rented one when we were in France and it was in French and she was very bossy and she oh. kept taking us on these routes that did not make any sense. And we just got to call her Little Missy because she was very oh. bossy. So <laughs> well, just my, dad, a my dad used to call me Missy. Okay. So I don't know why Little Missy came <laughs> up. I mean, she's tall, I'm little, so maybe that was it, but yeah. Yeah, finding a band name is sometimes it can be really hard. And Hen's Teeth, your yeah. duo. Yep, Hen's Teeth. Well, Alan always wanted to name a band Hen's Teeth because there's an expression in the UK, which I had never heard before, mm -hmm. as rare as Hen's Teeth. Okay. And so Nathan and I needed a, um, a name, and so we just decided to do that. It seemed to, it seemed to be fun. I really enjoy um, your album. Uh, off the cuff, what is it? Off, on the uh, off the cuff and on the fly. On the fly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so it's interesting because he's a cellist and banjo player and fiddler, and you both sing, and it's it's wonderful all the different combinations you come up with. And with him, you form the Idumea String Quartet, right? Yes, yeah. So Nathan Bontrager is a, a wonderful young um, cello player, banjo, fiddle, guitar singer. I mean, amazing musician, a classical musician of mm -hmm. of of great repute he lives in cologne germany where he went to do his masters in baroque music oh yeah he plays uh, gamba too right yeah he plays the viola de gamba you heard that on the on the mm -hmm. um heard him yeah. talk about that on the get up in the cool um and uh we met each other at clifftop and we played a bunch together and i remember i think it was the summer of 2015 or something we found ourselves playing without anybody else and he said, Janie, play that tune of yours that you wrote that I love. I don't remember which one it was. And we played it, and I, I looked at him and I said, dang, that's good. We should we should do some gigs or together or something. You know, I'm always doing that. And he said, well, I live in Germany. I said, well, I'll come over. So we, we put together these little tours, and we took buses and, you mm -hmm. know, did it, you know, real cheap and walked a lot with instruments and 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 then uh, I think it was the second second time we were over there. We went to we were in London, and he got a friend of his his who does recording to set it up in a after this coffee shop had closed. So we went there from eight to midnight and just laid down this recording with minimal rehearsal, um, and it's kind of cool. It's a kind of cool recording. I think it's available on Bandcamp. I have yeah. like two copies left of my own. You mean Hen's um, Teeth? And the Hens duo. Teeth, yeah. yeah, I bought it on Bandcamp. Yeah. Oh, you did? Okay, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So there's some there's some pretty uh there's some pretty interesting stuff in there. And then and we had started really sort of pushing the boundaries of our music and more improv -y things and just throwing it out there. And then we were playing a few years later in somewhere in England and Ewan McDonald, who plays in the another band with with Nathan, who is a Scottish guy who plays great Scottish and Celtic music, but also loves old time, American old time. And Becca Wolf, who was a violist who graduated, I think she was the first class that graduated from the Newcastle University traditional music degree up in England. They were down there and they came in and showed up at this little pub gig that we were doing and we had them come and play something we had never played to go together and it just went whoosh. 
And we looked at each other and went, whoa, that was really cool. So we spent the next couple of years when I would come over and do some do some gigs and we rehearsed madly for two or three days and then we, we made a recording and I lost track. 2019 maybe? 19, I yeah, I bought it on Bandcamp as well. <laughs> okay, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and we went, it was one of these epic kind of things where we, we got a, a record label to do it, um, Penny Fiddle Records. And we, a guy they know, got brought his mics and his computer. We went to this farmhouse that from an uncle of I think Becca's uncle or something, and it was had you know it was like the Rolling Stones or something like that. I mean, this big room with these pictures of these old people from the 1500s and lairds and lords and ladies and stuff. And we threw this CD together, and it's really out there. It's so exciting. Of course, it came out in March of 2020. But we do have plans to get together in November of this year. So mm -hmm. we're kind of excited about that. Yeah, I love, love that album. Oh, and it's you. Yeah, many of your beautiful original tunes, but some of the old, like Silver Dagger, that yeah. rendition is so Amazing. touching. Yeah, Becca is an incredible vocalist. Um, yeah, and to sing with while playing the viola too. It's just kind of oh, amazing yeah. to me. Like, it, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was. I think everything on that was live except for a couple of harmony overdubs mm -hmm. on that. Um, yeah, and actually Nathan and you and we're going to be. I'm going to see them oh, this month in a few weeks. They're going to be coming to the Clifftop Appalachian Music Festival, mm -hmm. so that'll be a nice reunion. Yeah. So when you met your husband Alan, um, he <laughs> played a tune. I think the story was it's like Amelia, Amelia Earhart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In search of and Amelia Earhart. Mm -hmm. And you had sort of been thinking about that tune, and then you heard him play it. It was yeah. One of those well, he was, I, yeah. I went to to my junior year at college, and the first week uh, there was a folk music concert. So of course I went. I brought my fiddle with me, and Alan had been traveling and visiting some uh, friends and musicians in um, New Jersey and Pennsylvania that he had met in Scotland, some Americans, and so he had been in America that summer and came back. He was wearing overalls <laughs> and uh he was accompanying his his a friend kenny haddon on the flute and kenny's brother martin was in the trio that we had haddon roth haddon rothfield and Carr in the 80s we made some epic recordings with that trio if i don't mind saying so but anyway he's playing the the guitar and then he says oh i'm gonna sing a bluegrass song i learned while i was in america and i just thought of that song and that's the song that he sang so i went and talked to him afterwards and the rest was history so uh, we talked a little bit about your teaching and I really would like to dig into that because, you know, I'm a violin teacher and I, of course, yeah. your place so uh, with such ease. Oh, and I'm curious how you convey that. Um, of course, you teach different instruments, but mm -hmm. with your violin students. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I do a lot of body movement and mm -hmm. vocalization to internalize the way you're supposed to sound on here mm -hmm. because there's technique, there's ways to play. You gotta put your fingers down, you know, you gotta know how to move your bow. But the music has gotta come from in here and in mm -hmm. here. Um, and, and for me, it's not just notes on a page. So really, the thing that I do with everything that I'm teaching is I have people sing the, the tune as though as they would like to play it. Mm -hmm. And if they can do that, especially with the rhythms, and if they can do that, then I find, oops, sorry, I'm moving bouncing um that'll come out better on their music so instead of playing sort of like um um those are just the notes right mm -hmm. but if we're going to put rhythm into it if you can sing it like Yum da da dum da 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 <laughs> and I mean, I you work with a lot of adults who are start like haven't played as children maybe or didn't get lessons. So do you find they're extra stiff? Um, you know, I this is gonna sound very egotistical. I I have a magic teaching powers. I just start them and I get them at ease, and I don't let them think too much. Mm -hmm. I just say, okay, put this up here, and we sort of get this. Okay, and just kind of relax. Okay, and I show them how to hold the bow, and then 
Sometimes I'll say, okay, show me how I'm hold, to hold the bow, and I'll have them move my, manipulate my fingers so that they sort mm -hmm. of are teaching it back to me. I do that yeah. a lot. And relax and breathe and just, and just try and pull the bow and show them that it's, it's not as hard as I think it's going to be because I think mm -hmm. we all get in our way. And um, just do it, do it bit by bit. Um, you know, take it, take it slow, but not too slow. Introduce putting the fingers down. For the fiddle, I think that if you're in the right position in your left hand, you put your finger down, you're gonna you're gonna be playing in tune. Mm -hmm. And usually, it's something wrong position-wise that's gonna make you not play in tune. You may slide back here. People tend to slide up here. Mm -hmm. You know, having just being being um, what's the word? Just kind of in the base camp, in mm -hmm. a good place, um, because it's if you're holding it this way when you put your fingers down, it's probably gonna be in the right place. And then there's all that repetition, the body, uh, what's it called, the muscle memory. Yeah. And are there certain tunes you always start people on or just whatever gets um, you fancy? Yeah, this actually starts, um, um, I'm trying to think what, I, yeah, they, the, sometimes the tunes do change. Mm -hmm. um, Usually, Angelina Baker or uh, Walking Up Georgia Row, a D tune, or a little like Sail Away Ladies, something simple. We, you know, we take a take a very, you can take a, a fiddle melody and break it down. I don't want to say dumb it down, but break it down to very few notes. Mm -hmm. So if you have a tune like um, Sail Away Ladies, which goes. <laughs> basic melody is so once they do that and it's not too hard then you start adding a little bit of rhythm so the idea is that um, and this is I don't I'm sure other people do this but I find I get a lot of people coming to me and they where they've learned all the the notes and then they try and get the bow to attach to the fingers. Mm -hmm. But my way is the fingers are attaching to the bow. Mm -hmm. So, which means once you get this bow going on automatic pilot, and I haven't added any fingers in there, I'm just mm -hmm. staying, playing a basic melody. So that's that's kind of a little bit more unusual for folks. And I, I really have a very strong, I guarantee people that if they can do that kind of thing and get the bow where it's on automatic pilot, then you're not worrying about what's going on here. And the fingers mm -hmm. can just do their thing and they'll attach. And then, you know, anyway, that's, I haven't, I don't have a, I don't have a description for that, but. Mm -hmm. Basically, the fingers attached to the bow. The bow's not playing to the fingers. Right. The rhythm leads. Rhythm the the leads. bow's like our breath. Like. Yeah, singers. the rhythm leads. I'm going to write that down. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> the rhythm so, leads. In old time music, there's a lot of Scottish and Irish uh, like roots to that. So when you were in Scotland, did you learn new tunes or like new ways of playing? Well, actually, just to just to make a uh, this is something that we've all been learning more in the last mm -hmm. few years is that you know the old time music really comes a lot of the people who came from the old world ended up you know being in West Virginia and Virginia and Kentucky and up in Quebec up in New England and things like that. But the banjo and the influence from the enslaved people mm -hmm. who were brought here against their will from Africa is really where a lot you know. That's yeah. kind of the wellspring for for the rhythms. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of tunes actually that sometimes we'll be playing, and Alan goes, "Oh, that's a Scottish song," and he'll sing the Scottish song of an old time tune. Mm -hmm. So, but to answer your question, I, you know, I went to Scotland not to learn Scottish music, although I had played, you know, I had played some Celtic music and Irish music and things like that. But I I wasn't really there for it. Um, and uh, but I, we do we went went to a lot of sessions and when I played uh, with Alan and Martin eventually we really blended the the two things together so my sensibility from old time music would go into the some of the Scottish songs and the arrangements and then vice versa this Celtic mm -hmm. sensibility would come into the some of the old time melodies that we were playing 
Um, but now there's a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of people all over the world who are playing old time music because, you know, we've all been traveling mm -hmm. and teaching and doing these camps that are everywhere and online and a lot of the Europeans and people from all over the world, Australia are coming, they come to, they show up at Clifftop and all these different festivals. So it's really a, a very small, a small world now. Um, yeah. I was looking up Clifftop and it was saying there's over 20 countries representative attendees and I wouldn't doubt that at all. Yeah. And I was curious, like you, you uh, have played this festival in Wales. It sounds like a lot of fun. Fire in the Mountain. Oh, right? Fire in the Mountain. Yeah, that was, yeah. I, I would, yeah, I, I really want to go back to there. That was, uh, <laughs> that was uh, an amazing experience um, because they, the people who run it um, are play a lot of old time music and Celtic music and, and they put this thing together where there's, world music, there was blues, there was jazz, rock and roll, Celtic, old time, uh, singer songwriters, music went on all night till <laughs> seven in the morning. I mean, and people were, you know, dancing and it takes place in this farm. So the main stage is in the middle of a farm courtyard, mm -hmm. you know, surrounded by stone barns and stuff like that mm -hmm. um and it's not like a not like thousands and thousands of people like it's you know some of the bigger festivals that you might see it's quite kind of small but very very incredible fire in the mountain it takes place i think like the last weekend in may mm -hmm. and if you can go there just be prepared to lose your mind <laughs> fun <laughs> um so oh so was i going to ask you I want to ask you about memorizing tunes because mm. you must have such a library of tunes in there. Is oh, it? Yeah. Do you know the words to a lot of them? Does that help, or how do you keep them straight? Ah, well, <laughs> you know, I find that I, I I remember a lot of tunes, but then I have my phone, <laughs> and um, you know, some people are really organized with their phones and their iPads and iPods where they have all the recordings, all the source recordings. I I never got around to doing that. <laughs> So, but I have, I do have um, a lot of tunes on my phone from sessions and people that I've played with. And so I just go back, I just did this last week and I just went, oh, there's that G tune. I, was, oh, if I hear a couple of notes, then I can remember how it goes. So, um, yeah, it's just really, it's repetition and hoping that the person that you're playing with, if you can't remember how to start it, that they will. We all rely on one another to do that. But as we get older, it's a little harder to recall all the tunes. And there's some people, I have some friends who are who are like tune hounds. Mm -hmm. That's a expression I heard a number of years ago where they just, they learn a ton of tunes and they're constantly learning lots of tunes. Um, and that's not to say that I don't, but I have other things that I'm doing that take up my musical space, like the Itumia Quartet stuff and the, the bands that I'm in and the teaching and things like that. So. I always think, oh, I'm going to learn this tune and that tune, and sometimes I do, but it's really a matter of um, just listening over and over again. I was teaching somebody a couple of months ago, and I was listening to, I have a CD, I think it was Melvin Wine, and I said, let's learn a tune from his CD. They said, really? I said, yeah, let's learn this tune together. And we went through the process where we listened to it, listened to it, we sang the tune, mm -hmm. we sang along, and then we did it phrase by phrase. We stopped, we rewound, we listened, Ooh, we missed that note. Where does it go? Does the tune go up? Does it go down? What's ha Oh, listen, you know, hear that little rhythm thing. What's going on there? You know, and it's really like training. You know, this is what I do with my students is really training your ears to hear these little things mm -hmm. that can just go by. But don't worry if you miss them because you you know it's it's fun right yeah <laughs> could, could you show us um you know I'm a, I'm a classical violinist so I'm kind of fascinated with the ornamentation that you you use could you show us like a couple different versions of like how you play a simple tune and you know add different things in yeah um let's see let's see what, I'm in D Oh, I know what I'll do. I'm going to go to cross A. Oh, I was going to ask you about this. She's tuning her violin. So, yep. This is, I'm tuning my fiddle to what's called cross A. And I'm tuning my G string up to A mm -hmm. and my D string up to E. 
So I have A E A E, mm -hmm. which means I can play two octaves with the same fingering, which is mm -hmm. nice. It also gives a nice, nice dronies things. And this is a tune actually I just um, discovered myself playing this tune on the banjo for something. I um, <laughs> and. Um, True to my own form, I start out slowly playing it kind of simply, and then I develop the tune and added different things. So I'll sort of show you uh, on this tune because it's a quite a simple tune. Let's see, it's called Candy Girl from Uncle Bunt Stevens. is pretty simple. Just repeats it, right? So then I'll do a little um, rhythmic thing, so I'll go. So slur, slur, didn't da didn't da didn't or I can go. sort of put a little swingy mm -hmm. it's all in the bow same finger yeah. right um, um. so there's a little technique it's sort of called rocking the bow trying to emulate the offbeat somehow. So you can use all sorts of different things to keep that beat going. Sometimes uh, Nathan, who's in plays with me with Hen's Teeth and Nidume Quartet, he had a great metaphor for, for finding a, a, a rhythm in a tune and it could I think it, this is true for any style of music I think mm -hmm. there's this carousel that's going around right and the carousel horses are always there there's there's this beat you know and you can jump on the carousel and you can jump off the carousel you don't mm -hmm. always have to be playing incessantly that beat but yeah. you have to it has to be internalized so you can go away and then come back and I think that when you have that kind of approach to it it means that you can take these different techniques and put them in different orders and play around with them, leaving space. Um, it's not so much about what's happening in the melody mm -hmm. in that, for that example. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Okay. Can't wait to, to teach you a tune. <laughs> oh, was that part of the plan? <laughs> no, not necessarily, but I'm <laughs> throwing it out today. there at some point. <laughs> yeah. At the time. Maybe not in front of my podcast audience. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe... I'm just... Yeah, I'm I just so glued to the page. It, it, I've been trying to not to get myself unglued through improvisation and trying different things, but playing by ear is not easy for me. Well, you know what the the, the fast track is? Just to sing the dang tune. Mm -hmm. Use your voice. Your voice yeah. will tell you everything to do. Yeah, and that'll get you out of this, whatever you do here, mm -hmm. and it'll get out of what's the brain that's thinking organizing stuff mm -hmm. and most musician classical musicians that I've taught they say the same thing and they're great they have no problem learning a tune by ear yeah I, I think see. I've never done it with a person like I've tried with recording sometimes but it's like mm -hmm. you say I think you have to know the form a little bit too if you know that there's a sort of form and then I don't know I think it's just it's just it's really just a little bit of bowing technique mm-hmm That'll, that'll give you the accent that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So is that the shuffle that you do? And there's sort of the ghosting with the Yeah, there's light. ghosting. I, I hate to say shuffle. I, I don't like to, sort of putting names to things mm-hmm. because I think it kind of, I, I, I'm more about what does it sound like? Mm-hmm. So the da 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 you know, just kind of um, have it be onomatopoeic, I guess. Because I think that if you can, it 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 gets too like I'll tell you this story. I I might have told this before on one of Cameron's podcast things. But uh, I had the opportunity to meet and play music with a couple of wonderful Kentucky musicians. Um, they've both since passed. Jimmy McCann, who I got to record a whole bunch of stuff with me on my I Fiddle, They Banjo CD. Um, epic bluegrass and old-time musician and singer. And, uh, and uh, a generation ahead of him was Paul David Smith. And then a generation of Paul David was Snake Owen Snake Chapman who is a revered traditional Kentucky fiddler and tune maker. He, he made up a lot of tunes too. I should play you one of his tunes. Um, but I asked Paul once about bowing patterns and things because I was finding that um, there's um, there's a certain subset of people who really need to know exactly what's going on. And I'm just not like that. So I don't teach that way. And there are fiddlers, wonderful fiddlers, who too teach a very specific way to bow a, a tune. Um, which they've learned from an old recording. This, this is how so and so bowed this tune, mm. and I respect that. It's not not what what I can do. So I asked Paul David about it, you know, and he never he never took a fiddle class in his life. You know, he was just played. He says, "Well, Jane, the bow either goes up or it goes down," which is true. You know, the bow may go up, it may go down, but the rhythm is always going to kind of be there. So that's why I think that if you use your voice to 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 emulate what you're trying to play on whatever instrument is that you're doing it it will inf- it will tell your right hand what to do mm-hmm. that's i really i believe that i i teach that it works it's yeah. amazing if i can get people to do it <laughs> yeah it's interesting what you're saying about the the african um influence and when i interviewed uh julie lyon lieberman on this podcast we talked about the blues violin fiddlers who were slaves and um, her research into that and you know they were uh, taught violin so they would play for the dances and um, you know the blues came out of that but I guess also this style like I, I can imagine these the dances you know basically contra dances which would have been that style of dancing that they would have been doing in that region I don't know in the, in the American South yeah oh yeah um you know, I'm not an academic, so Julie, yeah. she, she knows more about that stuff. But from what I've learned, you know, the banjo is, it's a drum. It's a rhythm instrument. And yeah. um, there's been a lot of research and, you know, Bela Fleck and other folks going to different countries in Africa. Yeah, I saw his movie. That was amazing. Yeah, finding these amazing musicians. And, you know, it's, 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 uh, I mean, folk music is, traditional music is, is folk pe- music of the people. And dancing was always you know, part of the expression of culture. So it would make sense that there would be body movement that goes along with it, with the tunes that we play. That's why, you I know, I was, yeah, I was just thinking, Jane, about just those types of rhythms. It's different than like Irish fiddling or Scottish fiddling. Like it is distinctive yeah. to American fiddling. So that's what I was thinking. It must be that um, connection. Anyway. Yeah, although it's interesting when I've played in, uh, in Quebec, Mm-hmm. Um, I find that my uh, that the, and and Shetland for some reason the the, mm-hmm. Shet, the Shetland people I've played with and people from Quebec it's it sounds a little bit sounds more old timey old time rhythm to me uh, than say Cape Breton which is very Scottish it's yeah. very on the one I mean it's mm-hmm. really really on the one and um, but then you know there's a whole lot of in Scotland in the 80s when we were there there was a whole sort of uh, there was a lot of exploration of music that was going on, a lot of the traditional bands and, you know, people putting um, swing swing chords to traditional Scottish tunes. Mm-hmm. But before even the 70s, before that, um, up in Shetland, um, uh, his name, nickname, Peary Willie Johnson, was a guitar player. And, and the story goes, and Alan tells the story, apparently he, in the 50s, I guess, uh, I think it might have been WGY, which is the radio station up in Albany, New York, 
was, you know, all this music that was being played in the 30s, 30s and 40s uh, was bouncing off and landing. You know, people in Shetland could get that radio station. Oh. <laughs> apparently. And so he developed the style of guitar that became the sort of the traditional way to accompany Shetland tunes hmm. with these a lot of swing chords, jazz chords and stuff like that. So you never know. Yeah. There's so much interesting cross-pollination with music, and um, it's it's very interesting, you know, I, I could, yeah, especially with the series, I talk to people from different kind of musical backgrounds, and, you know, the um, it, I think because music travels so easily compared to other yeah. elements of culture, more easily than language. Yeah, yeah that, that being said, you know, I, I always encourage the people that I'm teaching, if possible, to have them play for a square dancers or play mm-hmm. for a dance, because it is a whole nother experience it's not just replicating or playing a tune over and over and over and over again you know if you're if you're playing for dancers you can get this wonderful back and forth we have a wonderful contra dance band called Cora Cree yeah. um, and um, one of the things that we you know we, we 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 play the traditional tunes a lot of our own original tunes and we we push the envelopes a little bit but we always have our eyes on the floor watching those dancers and We've had the feedback where the dancers say, you know, I, it was so great. We really felt like, you know, you guys were playing for us as opposed to us dancing to you. And I, we said, well, yeah, we're getting feedback from what you're doing. And I yeah. I, I think that's just a wonderful thing. <laughs> I On um, season one of this podcast, I interviewed Alexis Chartrand, who's a traditional mm-hmm. Quebecois fiddler, and mm-hmm. both his parents are dancers. Um, actually, his mom's a Baroque dance specialist. Oh, Alex is, Chartrand? I'm, yeah. Oh, I, oh yeah, I, I know that family. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Yeah. His father yeah. is a great caller and That's dancer. And, oh my God, amazing. Yeah, you should listen to the episode with him. He, he plays and we talk about watching the dancers. I think that's how I found you because I think oh, I saw okay. you. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about your relationship to the banjo. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about my relationship with my husband. <laughs> Violin was your first love in music. It was my first instrument. My mother, actually, the the, the music in my family, my sister Susie Thompson mm-hmm. is also an amazing roots musician. I mean, she plays all the different American styles. She, I don't think she's really done much Celtic music, but she's an amazing mm-hmm. blues fiddler, old-time fiddler, bluegrass, Cajun, um, klezmer, great singer. Um, but my mom was a, I'm just going to move over so you can see my nice banjo. My mom, uh, was a folk, an old folky, you mm-hmm. know, from New York and Brooklyn. And, you know, when she met, uh, when I brought Alan home and he was singing some of these old ballads, she knew a bunch of them, mm-hmm. which I, I had no idea, but she played guitar and sort of always encouraged us. And we had a lot of, um, you know, early folk music, um, records and Pete Seeger and Burl Ives and other things happening in in our in our household and and then uh when my brothers started getting into playing uh, Susie started playing bluegrass and she was playing folk music and bluegrass and Doc Watson all this music started appearing with records in our house so it's it goes kind of back but I didn't come to the banjo until I think I was I was living in Los Angeles and everybody was playing the banjo and I decided to give it a try and how do it must feel so different than the fiddle? Like the uh, is there a lot of tension on the strings for your left hand or not really? Well, actually, I like to tell people I I actually fiddle the banjo because mm-hmm. I came to the banjo as a fiddle player, and I learned um, I learned how to do sort of the basic claw hammer rhythms, and ha- just played with a lot of banjo players. Never really had any lessons, mm-hmm. and um, hang on. So when I when I play the banjo, like I'm in the key of D now. And a, a lot of the fingering is similar to the fiddle. So this is my F sharp, right? And when I go here, that's my B, same finger on the fiddle. Mm-hmm. So it, I kind of, you know, if I'm on the D string, there's my F sharp. So I finger the banjo like a fiddler. Mm-hmm. So I, I I didn't really find it to be that hard. <laughs> so can you play us a tune and maybe we can talk a little bit about the technique of claw hammer? Sure. Let's see. What should I play? I'll play a tune that my friend Beth Hunter, who's next door, 
wanted me to help her learn when she mm-hmm. was first learning to play the fiddle. And it's a wonderful tune called Johnny Don't Come Home Drunk. Let's see if I can do this for you. Sort of similar kind of thing that would happen on the fiddle. Mm-hmm. Right hand keeps moving, and you hit the string with the back of your nail, and it's a bum di. There's a little fifth string that you kind of grab your thumb with. different kind of rhythm things and you talk about ghosting notes I just love the groove and the the sound yeah. of that it's so fun. I'm teaching a beginner, uh, beginner banjo class in Swannanoa um, mm-hmm. this summer. Um, I just spent the last couple of days working on my lesson plan and how I'm going to teach this stuff. And I realized I needed to have some good, good, easy things for them to play. So like, you are my sunshine. Um, uh, will the circle be unbroken? Uh, when the saints come marching in, things that they're familiar with, you know? Mm-hmm. So they, they can just, you know, get their right hand going and then just have it nice and simple. And it's a really fun instrument. It's, it's, um, you should learn the banjo. <laughs> that, is that a capo you have? Yeah, this is a capo. Um, so basically I, I've tuned the banjo. It's what's called double C. And then a lot of times, uh, I'll put it, I'll slap a capo on just because it's easier than retuning. And, mm-hmm. um, but a lot of a lot of banjo players will retune so they don't use a capo Mm -hmm. but i'm working musician so i gotta do what i gotta do no no i was just curious so a non i don't know what even called like the other style of banjo playing that's not claw hammer what's that called just uh finger style finger Finger style style, um finger style bluegrass the bluegrass Mm -hmm. uh don't typically retune their instruments Mm -hmm. they they figure out how to play everything like that and I, I don't know how to do that <laughs> and are they using like picks on their fingers i'm quite yep, they're using picks stuff. yep yep and there's certain patterns that they use and it's very very complicated but it's a wonderful i mean a lot of people play it and love it and go to banjo camps to learn how to do it and yeah so bluegrass kind of evolved out of old times am i right about that yeah you know i uh there's a lot of people who are academics who know all <laughs> about that kind of thing um, yes, but I believe I would be go out on the limb and say that bluegrass developed from old old style country music because mm-hmm. um, old time was just old old style country music. That's just what was was played. Yeah. Um, you know, and then for the banjo, Earl Scruggs sort of adapted a di- figured out a a certain kind of way of picking Scruggs style. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's an old style of old time style of picking that's uh where you're picking the strings but it's not bluegrass yeah so but uh i'm not an academic about that kind of thing but you're right yeah that that's already um interesting no i i, I had read that bluegrass was like for banjos more of a solo thing as opposed to old time which is more accompanimental does that make sense yeah well that's an interesting it's an interesting um discussion because um and typically in and i'm just gonna give my opinion about this in in old time if you're playing old time session old time bands there's not a lot of soloing going on Mm -hmm. right um and in bluegrass it's really is all about the solo which 
surprised me when I first when I realized that I was at a uh, playing with a wonderful bluegrass fiddler named Blaine Sprouse who I should connect you with you should mm-hmm. interview him because his teacher was Kenny Baker and Blaine is an epic fit bluegrass fiddler like amazing um, but we I said hey Blaine let's let's play some tunes we're at a at Festival of American Fiddle Tunes up in the Northwest. He said, okay. And I said, I said, what should we play? He says, I don't know. Let's play a good old tune like Angelina Baker. I said, okay. So if, so I'm, we're sitting face to face. I start playing. And he's kind of chunking and doing chords. And then then he starts playing the melody. And I keep playing because I want to have this musical conversation. And then we finish. I said, he says, well, you know, Jane, usually we, we don't play those tunes together, you know. I said, well, why? It's fun. You know, we can have some fun, you know, having a little musical conversation and stuff. He goes, well, you know, why would I want you playing over my break? And yeah. I went, oh, I said, well, let's do it another tune, but let's not think like we're taking breaks. Let's just play the tunes together, you know? <laughs> and then we did. He says, oh yeah, that was really fun. I forgot what that was like, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but a lot of times when I'm playing at a session or a jam with somebody, I'll, I just, sometimes I'll just I'll just back off and play chords because I want to hear what the other person's doing. Mm-hmm. Or I'll say, banjo, take a break because I want to hear what that banjo's playing, you know, because it could be something marvelous, you know. And they're like, what? I'm not taking a break. Say, go on, go on. It's like, so, um, yeah, it's a different kind of social social thing too. Yeah, it's more style. like jazz if it's like take me solos. Um, yeah. Is there a tune you really like to play on banjo that you'd like to share with us? play okay i'm gonna play a little bit of candy girl on the banjo which i play in the little bit on the fiddle earlier yeah. i think that'll be really fun hearing uh, the same tune on different instruments like that yeah it's it's, fun. it's kind of fun it's um you sort of get into this kind of uh especially that tune because it's a sort of a circular tune you know and every time i hit this note i realized that this note was a little bit flat and i had to <laughs> like force myself to just make it work <laughs> an illusion of being in tune you play a little guitar too yeah i play backup guitar i'm i'm mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I'm a pretty good backup guitar player. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did Alan teach you? Alan did not teach me. Okay. Um, I learned basic chords. Uh, he showed me a few things, but yeah. um, no, just from playing and listening and sitting on in a few guitar workshops. And, you know, it's, it's really all about making everything sound good, you know, and keeping the rhythm uh, but Alan is a very good teacher he's he's mm-hmm. been doing a lot more guitar teaching in the last couple of years and uh, he has a, a very interesting style of playing backup guitar which is um, he does a sort of these bass run things he does different alternate chords up the neck just gets different mm-hmm. voicings you know um, so he has his own way of pushing the envelope 
Yeah. He's also a marvelous, marvelous singer. Yeah, I've heard him a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I interviewed Brendan Power a few episodes ago on this podcast. So people who haven't heard that episode should go check it out. It's an amazing harmonica player. And the album you made with him is so cool. Such an interesting mix of sonorities with fiddle and harmonica. Can you talk to that experience of meeting him and how that got going? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I find that when I'm going to festivals, um, and I, I think I I think I do this on purpose, but subconsciously sort of ish. Mm -hmm. There's usually I usually there's somebody that I I kind of target. I hear them play or something. I go, I want to play with that person. And I'll go up like Blaine Sprouse, Brendan Power. I heard him play. I said, Oh man, I gotta we gotta play. We gotta play together. I said, Hey Brendan, you want to play? He says, Sure. <laughs> I think he maybe had seen me play. I was there with mm -hmm. um, this was in Montreal. I was up there with this wonderful but ill-fated band that didn't last called panache quartet mm -hmm. which was four amazing female fiddlers uh, me and old time donna a bear from new england um uh andrea beaton from cape breton and um veronique place from quebec and we four fiddles and it's just like phew, but anyway, so I saw him. He said, so we, we found a little place in a little quarter, and we just sat down. What should we play? And you know, he had he had liked American music, so he had a quite a quite a number of tunes. And mm -hmm. so we started playing together, and it sounded really cool. And then he showed me one of his original tunes, and I showed him one of my original tunes, and it was just really really fun. And then that was it. And then I was going back to England to tour, so I got in touch with him and. He came to a Hen's Teeth show and sat mm -hmm. in on a couple of tunes. And then the next time I was there, he said, why don't you come down and visit me and my partner, Laura, and let's make an album. And he does this. He, he yeah. gets involved with different styles, as you know, Chinese music, whatever, and and gets gets sort of deep into it. And and so we did. So we just, uh, we just recorded this really cool album and his friend um, Dave, remember Dave's last name played a little bit of a uh, banjo and we just had a good time throwing some stuff down and then he actually came to Clifftop with Laura and we had a CD release party there and that was kind of epic but he says Jane there's so much old time <laughs> he says I gotta go find a blues session or something you know he was going a little bit crazy like I can't sleep <laughs> like yeah oh, yeah so but uh, that was really exciting and um yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen him for quite a while, but he's an amazing musician and artist, and he creates these harmonicas out of, what is it called? Um, uh, cre uh, the computer-generated plastic stuff. What's that called? Yeah, well, he he does a couple different things, and I can't. I know what you mean, and I can't think of the word, but yes, and we, yeah. we talked, and, and all these retunings that he does. Yeah, yeah. So innovative. Um, yeah, very, very innovative in China and all this. Yeah, so and a great Irish. He was in a he was in Riverdance, the first Riverdance. Yeah, which he said that's how he was able to buy his house. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, I miss Brendan. I hope we get to see him again sometime. Yeah, and there's a little thing that came up when I was researching old time music called fiddle sticks. Have you seen this technique used? Uh, yeah, when they you whack the the sticks on the thing. Yeah, I I've seen it used. I've never actually done it. I've 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 had someone fiddle stick me while I'm playing the fiddle. But uh, yeah, it's really cool. I don't, yeah. I don't see it around very much, but it'd be fun fun thing to learn. Yeah, we just uh, my orchestra we just premiered a concerto, a percussion concerto, by Nicole Lise, and the soloist was Colin Curry, who's actually a Scottish um, amazing percussion soloist. And she just used so many different techniques. So he had all these different, um, across this huge stage, all these different uh, traditional percussion instruments and crazy stuff like duct tape, anything that would make a sound. And then our principal cellist went up and played and then he was doing fiddle sticks on her, which I, the first time I'd heard of it or seen it, so I thought she'd come up with it. But then when I read about fiddle sticks in Appalachian music, I was like, oh, it's a thing that she yeah, borrowed. It's a thing. Yeah, I, which I have to have to look that up. I had never thought to look that up. It's it's probably got a very interesting um, history and background, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe probably. someone just did it once at a party and it became a thing. Like who knows? Yeah, I, you know, there's a whole tradition of of wood carving and wood whittling and things like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, 
you can you can go to the John C. Campbell Folk School. I've taught there a couple of times, and they have all sorts of um, Appalachian folk arts and crafts mm-hmm. and all sorts of things, and five different ways to cut wood. You yeah. Know? <laughs> And have you ever done any kind of clogging or or foot percussion with playing? Is that any of the tradition you've learned? Uh, I I have a, uh, not really. I, it's, Mm -hmm. it's sort of on my bucket list. I don't know if Mm -hmm. I'll ever get to it, but I can do a couple of little, little, little dance steps and stuff like that. It's, um, it's, uh, it's an an amazing thing to be able to do. And everybody loves to move their feet and it doesn't, you know, you can just do a basic shuffle step kind of thing and, you know, it's it's going to be good. But some of the people that I know who dance, um, Nick Garris and uh, all these amazing cloggers and step dancers, and it's just it's amazing what they can do. Mm-hmm. So I was curious if you wouldn't mind grabbing your fiddle again. If sure. um, yeah, you, we had talked about traditions and and some of the mentors you had. Um, learn from and you had you had referred someone that you were going to play one of his tunes and of course you write so many great original tunes so I was wondering if you want to um, yeah. play one or two to, to leave out with or yeah um, yeah let's see I'm in cross A this is a tune that I played a lot uh, actually I think Cameron DeWitt was the was the first person who learned this tune for me, and it's called what's it called? Ah, I'll remember after I'm done. I did make this up on the banjo though, but I like to play it on the fiddle, and it's a little bit of a a little bit of a squirrely crazy tune actually. And that on one of his um, podcasts with with my daughter, with Shona, there's a wonderful video of the three of us playing this tune. And every time I listen to it, I think, oh my God, it was that me? It was so fun, it was so great. Um, it's called, oh, I know what it's called. Okay, so there's a there's a uh, wonderful fiddler from Indiana who passed away way too young, I think he was 50, Gary Harrison, who made up of tons of tunes and when I first first real you know when I was playing fiddle in my tor- early 20s I learned all these tunes I had no idea these were his tunes and um, and he so I made up this this particular tune and Cameron was the one that said it sounded like a Gary Harrison tune so I said let's call it Harry Garrison so let's call Harry Garrison um, I think I think I might have recorded this with Brendan too I don't remember <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, I've heard you do that, you know, in other settings, and it's it's so different every time. It's really it great. Is. It really is. It's so funny. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate having a chat with you and getting to know you a bit more. And my offer still stands anytime. I'll show you how to play the fiddle. It'll be so fun. <laughs> I will take you up on that. But I'm curious. Um, you, you know, you have so much. You've had so much initiative in your career. I think you just get yeah. stuff going. So. And it seems like you have a very outgoing personality. Maybe you're a bit of an extrovert, would you say? You take energy from pe like from people, you don't get... I do, but you know, it's so interesting. In the last two years, I discovered mm -hmm. my inner introvert. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that I really like to have my alone time. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no, I do. I, I definitely, I, I suck the energy from other people and I love having interactions and it just makes me feel good, you know? Um, I, I want everybody to feel as good as I feel when I'm playing my fiddle, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it, it is a bit, it definitely is a calling. Like I, I remember the moment I, it must've been in, I don't know, the 1990s at some point, early nineties. I think I was at a, we were at a party. I think she, my daughter was really young and, um, Pete Peterson and Kelly Allen, you heard me talk about them, fabulous musicians. And I was sitting there and I was playing a, a one of my tunes. It was a tune called Violet's Waltz, one of my waltzes. And this woman was in the corner. She was kind of weeping. You know? And I said, are you okay? She goes, you play with such joy. I, just, I was like, whoa, that's, that's powerful. And, and I just kind of, I realized that it was, that, you know, I, I'm not a religious person, but I know about religious callings. And it was just, I just, it's, I just have to do it. So I, I am being quite a motivated person and having a quite good sales and marketing skills and tenaciousness and wanting to get things done. Cause I don't like waiting for people to do it for me. Yeah. That's how I've kept this thing going because mm -hmm. if I don't do it, no one's going to do it for me. Yeah. So, and it's fun. <laughs> And it feels good so and I guess you're not shy about like you're saying collaborations you just ask you know you just yeah you people. know most people will say sure mm -hmm. you know and um, you know it, it, it's 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 I don't, I don't know how often that happens out there maybe it doesn't happen often enough so when someone does ask them if they want to play they're like delighted mm -hmm. or something I don't know um, I was at a festival once and I saw this sort of epic old time fiddler that I know, a contemporary of mine. And I, I, I played with him once before and I thought, oh, I said, you know, hey, you know, you want to, you want to play? And he goes, well, you know, I have, I have plans to play with some other people. And I was like, usually that means no. And I was like, well, when, when are your plans? <laughs> and he says, well, in a couple of, at, at two hours, I said, look, let's just play a couple of tunes. And, you know, it's, we don't have to just play a couple of tunes and then we can be done. And he's like, oh, I said, look, I don't want to marry you. I just want to play a couple of tunes. I love it. <laughs> he said, okay. And he got his wife who played guitar and we played tunes for two hours. And when we were done, they went off to their next date. But I always tell that story because it's like, look, I, I'm not, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not asking you to spend the rest of your life with me. Just, just play a couple of tunes because at festivals and things like that, you know, people do have agendas and they have people they want to play with and they don't want to get stuck in a jam that maybe they don't want to be in or I don't know whatever it's like you know so I thought that was pretty funny and it was really fun yeah that's great <laughs> you know you didn't play a waltz or any kind of slow tune oh you're right you, I didn't if you'd be up for it I will to keep you here <laughs> I'll play this I, I'm in cross a so I'm not going to retune this is a this is actually one of my epic tunes and anyway, I played this um with the panache quartet with the four fiddles and it was amazing and i keeping hoping that um the Idumea quartet will will work this one up it's a tune called the mist and i was actually on a retreat with my sister susie uh we were in a yurt in um in california off of the coast south of san francisco the epic place i can't remember what it's called um to do a retreat to play music together and maybe make up some make up some music and we were sitting there and and it was supposed to be a beautiful view and it was completely socked in and it was all misty and stuff like that and she said Janie you know you should you should make up a tune I said I, I guess I will and I looked out the window and at that point the brown cow was running past the window and the owner of the brown cow was running after it to try and catch it I don't know it was like oh 
And so this tune just showed up and it's called The Mist. And someone asked me if it was The Mist, M-I-S-S-E-D. I thought it could be because it has that kind of bittersweet feeling. So I'll just play this for you. All right, so here we go. amazing having these private concerts of course they're not private because my audience is enjoying them <laughs> as well and that's some of the intimacy of podcasts I like is people you know are often with their headphones maybe they're going for a walk or whatever they're doing and having this you know Janie Rothfield play for them it feels like themselves it's, it's such a neat feeling I think well it's it's a delight to play I haven't played that tune in ages so thank you for reminding me about that particular tune well, thanks so much for your um, your time and your perspectives and your beautiful music today. I really oh, enjoyed it. Thank you, sweetie. I'm so happy to, to get to talk to you, and I look forward to meeting you in person one day. That would be awesome. Okay, bye. Bye. My life is so enriched by getting to know these incredibly inspiring creative guests and their perspectives on their lives and music. Please follow this podcast and sign up for my podcast newsletter to get sneak peeks for upcoming guests and find out about newly published transcripts. 